Well, good morning, everyone. And on behalf of Wood Solutions and the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects, I welcome you to our webinar series on wood specification and use in external applications. In the spirit of reconciliation, Forest and Wood Products Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, and we acknowledge their connection to the land and their custodianship of country and forests. We pay our respects to elders past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So my name's Alistair Woodard, I'm part of the Wood Solutions technical team, and I'm here to uh, host our webinar series. This is the fourth in our series of five on timber preservation and external finishes, and our last uh, webinar in uh, next week on the 26th on wood in bushfire prone areas. Um, wood Solutions, it's an initiative that's uh, funded by our Forest and Wood Products Australia. We're really here to assist you guys. Uh, we want to inspire you to use wood in all your different products. And then if you want to do that, to help you however we can with the information and resources you need to specify that correctly. So we do a whole range of activities such as events, uh, um, as, like these webinars and seminars, sponsor of the major organizations, do in-house tutorials. And as I've mentioned previously, produce a range of technical design guides, which is really quite important uh, in terms of that, uh, that technical information, all of which is available for the woodsolutions.com website. And there's two uh, tech guides in particular I just want to bring to your attention today because um, both presentations will uh, cover information that uh, is included in these guides. So number five on timber service life design and designing for durability, which has information on preservation and then finishing timber externally. So you can download these, these are free. Uh, you can get them from the woodsolutions.com.au website. <laughs> also, just a reminder that um, we undertake a range of different events. Um, so if you want to see what's going on with Wood Solutions, again, just go to the website. You can, um, if you haven't already uh, subscribed to the last uh, webinar next week, you can do so uh, uh, from, from the Wood Solutions website. Also, just a reminder that all the webinars that um, we undertake are all recorded and you can access that from the website again. Just type either website into the search function or click on that resources tab where it says webinars and podcasts and you can access all the different uh, webinars that we've run in the past from that point. And in terms of interacting today with today's webinar, just a reminder that if you'd like to chat amongst yourselves, just use the chat function, but the all panellists and attendee link. Um, but most importantly, we're very keen to get your questions. We'll run a 10-minute question session at the end, uh, if, if there's time. And um, so please add your questions in the Q&A tab down the bottom as we go. If you like them, someone else's question, you can click on that and that'll prioritise those to the top. Um, also a reminder that um, you can get informal CPD points for participation in today's webinar. So um, you'll get a certificate of completion that will be sent to you within in a week of the webinar from the Wood Solutions team please store those uh, those certificates in a safe place because we really can't reissue them. If you don't see them in your normal mail, just have a look in your junk mail folder. Sometimes they turn up at that point. <laughs> so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Firstly, Jack Norton, who is a timber protection specialist, a past president of the International Research Group on Wood Protection and the current National Secretary of the Timber Preservers Association of Australia. Jack's a chemist with more than 40 years experience in providing advice education and research services in wood protection processes, application of wood preservative chemicals, monitoring and quality systems, environmental requirements relating to wood preservation process and the wood protection, uh, protection industry. <clears throat> Although he's retired from full-time work, Jack continues to provide consultancy and advisory services to users, specifiers and the wood preservation industry. Our second speaker today will be Gareth Connell, who's the National Specification Manager with Cabot's Premium Wood Care Brands. Gareth has, Gareth has been involved in the coating industry for over 34 years, delivering high performance coating solutions in Australia, Southeast Asia, Europe and China. His expertise spans a wide portfolio of technology bases from high performance facade finishing systems, protective decorative automotive and the wood coating technological environment. So both speakers are eminently qualified to speak today on our topic of timber preservation and external finishes. <clears throat> In terms of the learning outcomes we're hoping you'll get out of today's presentation, they are an understanding of when timber preservation is required and the different preservative uh, methods available for each particular hazard class, an understanding of the different external timber coating systems available and where best to use them, and an understanding of the importance of correct specification and ongoing inspection and maintenance. So without further ado, I'll stop sharing my screen and hand over to Jack.
Okie dokie, okie dokie. Just a minute, I'll, I'll beat this technology yet. <laughs> Share. It's gonna happen, gentlemen, or ladies and gentlemen, it's gonna happen. Perfect. Right. Again. right, we got there. We got there. Okie doke. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Alistair. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you guys. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about timber durability, wood protection, wood preservation. And um, I think the take home message from my presentation is that if you've got any questions, please ask. Just ask because there are people here that uh, can help. And um, yeah, there's information available to you. Right, now the, um, the first thing is, is uh, do you guys see this strip across the bottom? Is I, should I be doing something about that there? Alistair, can you help me out here? Yeah, things are all looking fine on our screen, Jack. Okay, excellent. All right. What are, one of the big things is a lot of people in this country um, don't realise how Australia compares to other countries. We're a big country and we expect wood to perform um, in an awful lot of different environments. The environment in Tasmania is not the same as the environment in uh, Mount Isa. It's not the same as the environment in Innisfail. Um, so we, we expect, we have one set of specifications for the whole country and we expect the wood to, to perform in all of them. A lot of the criticisms that I hear, or other comments that I hear, is, "Oh, we don't do this in the U.S. We don't do this in the U.S. Uh, in the, in Europe." Well, Australia it has its own special set of conditions. We use an awful lot of timber in Australia. Um, I'm in Queensland. On the left there, here you can see the classic Queenslander house. That actually is my place. Um, we got the cladding over here, forest red gum, lattice, all right, CCA treated pine, um, the tunica lattice um, doors, spotted gum posts, decking, da, da, da. You guys know all about this. Lots of treated pine in the decking, uh, seating, landscaping. Okay, so we do use an awful lot of wood. I believe we use it um, probably not as much as the Kiwis, but a lot more than Europe and, and the US. Now, when we're talking about wood preservation in Australia, all right, we are not talking about chemical breakdown. We are not talking about weathering. The wood preservation does not stop weathering. We are not talking about fire protection. And perhaps most importantly, we're not talking about uh, wood not being used properly. There's a lot of poor, poor, poor use of timber out there for a building product that's been around for a long time. Um, it is really not used the best way it can. When we talk wood preservation, all right, focus on the preservation, wood preservation in Australia, we're talking about stopping decay or rot. We're still talking about stopping insect attack, all right? Some lot of pine does, tends not to get attacked by queen, um, insects in my part of the world. Um, I'm, the eucalypts do have a lot of, lot of uh, insect problems. And we're talking about termite attack. You're all familiar with termites. Finally, not a big deal in Australia because we don't tend to use much wood in the marine environment. We're talking about marine borer attack. Now, we can, we can stop the hazards, those hazards um, by detailing, very, very important. Often uh, wood is pushed too far because the detailing is correct. I'm going to talk about natural durability Okay, we can stop that uh, the attack by using timber that is naturally durable. Um, are you going to expect the same uh, service life out of radiata pine in the ground as you are out of iron bark and spotted gum? Preservative treatment, I'm going to talk about that and try and show you the relationship between preservative treatment and natural durability. I'll try and draw the link there. Now, Tim, you've got to consider timber to be like a bunch of straws, uh, vertical straws. The um, carbon dioxide uh, is picked up from the air. Water is picked up from the roots. They travel up the stem, down the stem, 
and then they go out to the outside to an area just under the bark. Um, now, that's called the cambium layer. You don't have to remember that. But next time you're peeling an onion in the kitchen, just under the under the uh, uh, the skin on the outside, you've got this bright or light, filmy stuff that you tend to peel off. That's the cambium layer. That's where the growth process is taking place. So trees will grow outwards. Trees do not grow upwards. It's kind of like stacking coffee cups, paper coffee cups like that. They gain height um, because they, um, they've grown outwards. Now, the, the thing is with the fluid pathways, the carbon dioxide um, from the air, and as I say, the water from the air, they've got to travel up and down here. So what we get is a series of pipes. It's like a bunch of straws, a series of pipes. The pipes on the outside are empty and the pipes on the inside are full of resins and waxes that tend to stiffen the stem to stop the tree from flopping over. So we've got filled up pipework in the middle. We've got hollow pipework here on the outside. And we use the same pipework to get wood preservative liquids into the wood. So we've got basically two zones. Actually, I'll give you the next slide as well. We've got two zones in a tree. We've got the heartwood or true wood. Listen to the term. I didn't say hard wood. I said heartwood. All right. And we've got the sapwood. The growth layer is on just under here, under the bark. The pipework carrying the food and nutrients up and down the stem is, is basically through the whole lot, but this stuff is full of tree junk. And so we've got uh, in a conifer log like this, we've got quite a bit of sapwood. In a eucalypt log, maximum we'd have about 50 millimeters of sapwood. So during the soaring process, when we turn a round thing into a rectangular thing, you can see from these diagrams that we've got different amounts of sapwood on a piece of wood. All right, now it, you'll remember, I hope that I told you before, the pipes out here are empty and we use the same pipes to carry wood preservative into the wood. So what we can effectively treat is this zone here. The Australian standards, the specifications talk about full sapwood penetration. So if you've got this lump of wood here, Let's pretend that's a railway sleeper or a landscape, not a railway sleeper, a landscape sleeper. All right. Um, then this is the bit that's protected. This bit is only protected by whatever is on the surface of the wood there. All right. So this is fully impregnated with wood preservative. This bit is not fully impregnated with wood preservative. So if you do any cutting, drilling, or boring, you are likely to expose unpenetrated timber. Now, the um, uh, this bit here, the heartwood, is um, uh, you know, has uh, full uh, pipework. The pipework's clogged up. So what we're reliant on is the natural resistance or the natural durability of the heartwood. So sapwood, when it's untreated is not, not naturally durable uh, or is, is non-durable. The hardwood is durable and we have a, a decay classification that looks like this. This is called the natural durability classification against decay, against decay uh, when timber is in the ground and timber is above ground. So for example, Cypress pine has highly durable heartwood. You can expect that to last more than 25 years in ground, 40 years above ground. Iron bark, same thing, highly durable heartwood, the heartwood. Then you go down to here, you've got radiata pine, and you're looking at around five years performance uh, in the ground and up to seven years above ground. Interestingly, some of the ash timbers, in, in particularly in Victoria and Tasmania, they're eucalypts all right, 
but they're low durability eucalypts. So that means the heartwood of, of Vic Ash, you can, you, that's the sort of life you're looking at in ground. All right, so we've got a natural durability classification of timbers in Australia. We have probably around 350 species of timber available in Australia. Practically, we wouldn't use more than 10. All right, so eucalyptus night shining gum out of Tasmania, low durability species. Um, as I said before, iron bark, high durability, spotted gum, there is a durability class two species. So in ground, we're looking at about 25. Interestingly, have a look at the spread. That's a hell of a big spread because you can get two pieces of, um, of spotted gum in the ground next to each other and one will fail and the other won't. So you, there is a spread. It looks, looks pretty good above ground. Now, in terms of um, decay, uh, uh, durability against insects and termites, um, the, they are either resistant or they're not resistant. And so they are, well, naturally durable or undurable. And you've got, a, got the species uh, all listed here in the Australian standard. Um, that's only just been recently reviewed. I should have updated the date. It was reviewed last year. It's only just come out. And I'll talk more about this later. So, Okay, I said before that we can't protect all the wood. Here, we're reliant on the natural durability of the heartwood. Here, we're looking at uh, protecting the, the sapwood with wood preservative. Now, where are you going to use timber? Back when we, when we originally designed this, the original usages of timber were inside, outside above ground, ground contact and marine. Originally, we had four hazard classes. Now, when we started negotiating the Australian standard, um, Australian standards are basically the lowest common denominator when a bunch of people can agree to everything, all right? So there's give and take on both sides. In Queensland, we used to have four durability classifications, but during the negotiations process, we broke it up into these. So H1 and H2, right? Insects and termites are the hazard uh, and they're inside. That tells us that we can use wood preservatives that will dissolve in water, but don't fix to the wood. H3 is outside, oh, sorry, up here, we're looking at things like um, uh, decking, uh, not decking, floorboards, um, architraves, anything used inside the house. Here, H3, Outside above ground, we're looking at cladding, balustrading, um, pergola posts out of the ground, uh, anything out of ground contact. This stuff here, the important difference for H3 is that it can dry out. All right, so it's not wet all the time, wet or damp all the time. H4 is ground contact, so is H5. These are in ground contact all the time. And with ground contact material, um, the, um, the difference between H4 and H5 is the criticality of the job. If it's a super critical job like a power pole, it's got to be H5. If it's a retaining wall over one metre high, it's got to be H5. Or, or it's, the building code says it's got to be H5. Um, if it's a retaining wall up to a metre, it can be H4. And H6 marine is, um, you know, like marine organisms. Um, and there are you know, a couple of different types there as landscape architects. I don't think that particularly worries you. Let me know if it does. Um, so as you go up the hazard classes, we need to put more and more chemical into the wood to stop these things. Now we're looking at long-term protection here so that we can bring up the durability of the sapwood to something that's useful for building. You don't need to remember this. All I'm doing is showing you that um, the, um, there are specifications that look something like this that are available. This is not your problem. I'm just showing you that there is a reason behind the H4 and the H5. You can see here, CCA preservatives tells us how much chemical we've got to have in it for conifers and hardwoods. For ACQ wood preservative, 
again tells us what we've got there. Now, I hope you remember back before we were talking about natural durability classifications. All right, for sawn and round timber, for H1, all the beetle susceptible timber, sapwood has to be treated. The heartwood is not, uh, not susceptible. For H2, we need all the sapwood and about five millimeters of heartwood in from the hardwood surface. H3, again, it's thick to space. So what I'm trying to tell you here is for durability class one and class two hardwoods, we only need to treat the sapwood. For class three and class four hardwoods or, or timbers, we need to treat the sapwood plus get some heartwood penetration. So what I'm trying to show you is that for each hazard class, there is a specification of all sapwood protection plus different levels of hardwood protection. Not your problem. What I want you to take away from this is that, um, that we've covered both the non-durable sapwood and the uh, durable hardwood. Now, in Australia, when we start talking preservatives, most people think um, CCA. And that's really, really unfortunate. In 2021, there were about two and a half million cubic metres of wood preserved in Australia. We actually imported probably about the same amount. All right. So how does that break down? This is the kind of thing that we're looking at. We're looking at about 30%, about a third is CCA. Uh, about 7% as ACQ and copper azole. They come under different names. Um, I can't remember them, to be honest, Jade, right off the top of my head. This one here is really, really interesting. About 20, 25 years ago, there was none of this. This is basically treated house framing. The F stand is for envelope treatment, tells me that it's an envelope treatment, which is to be used south of the Tropic of Capricorn. Just about half, nearly half the Pine timber in Australia is envelope treated. Water-based azole is a different prior type of preservative. Light organic solvent preservative. Unfortunately, um, some people call it LSOP. It's not right. It's L-O-S-P, light organic solvent preservative. That's for preservatives dissolved in organic solvent. And this is sapstain and boron. Sapstain is the blue stuff you've seen on pine. Queensland pine is particularly prone to this sort of stain more so than radiata, and boron preservatives are for only for lictus susceptible or beetle susceptible timber. Now, this one and this one are dissolved in water. It's uh, the broad classification for wood preservatives is um, dissolved in water or dissolved in organic solvent, like oil or light organic solvent. This one here is um, can be water or, um, or a suspension. That's water. This one's an organic solvent. Um, and I, can, I will show you some examples of this later on. These are the preservatives currently approved in Australia. You can see there for every hazard class, every hazard class, some of the, there are some are approved, some are not approved. For example, boron that I mentioned before is approved for H1 and H2. Boron is an awesome wood preservative, wonderful wood preservative. The trouble is it washes out of the wood. So we can't put it into an environment where it gets wet. Um, CCA, ACQ and copper azole chemically bind to the wood. They chemically react with the wood. And once they're chemically reacted, they don't wash out. Creosote dissolves in an oil, is an oil or a tar. These are also oil or tar or LOSP preservatives and they bind and they're dissolved in organic solvent so they're not water soluble. There are also some glue line timbers. As landscape architects you will predominantly I imagine be interested in CCA, ACQ and copper azole because they're the ones landscape outside therefore it's got to be fixed to the wood. Organic solvent preservatives, um, you will see this sometimes um, on things like balustrading, handrail. Um, they're, um, as I said before, they're dissolved in organic solvents. The beauty of these things is that you treat them in final shape and form. When you treat with a water-based preservative, it raises the grain 
um, pine will absorb about five to 600 liters of cubic meter of water. Hardwoods will probably absorb somewhere in the order of 300 to 400 liters per cubic meter. So when you start absorbing those quantities of water, it changes the shape of the, the wood will swell and it will raise the grain. With LOSP preservatives, that doesn't happen. And there the fungicides kills the fungi and there the insecticides. You still with me guys? Now, in terms of regulatory requirements, um, the, because we kill things with wood preservatives, um, LO, um, it's, it comes under the banner of the APVMA, the uh, Australasian Pest and Veterinary Medicines Authority. They set the rules. It's a bunch of feds. They look at data packs to see if the stuff works. Um, it, as you can see there, success. you've got to have a bucket load of money and have plenty of time to get something through the APVMA. APVMA makes you pay for new wood preservatives and um, um, it, takes, it takes some periods of time. They approve a label. Now, every agricultural chemical has to go through these guys. They approve a label that tells you how you can use the product. The problem with APVMA problem, the uh, thing with the APVMA thing is it only it's only about, about biological attack. It's not about per, a, per, appearance. I had a very interesting ex, ex, experience with an architect a couple of months ago. We were looking at bits of wood in the field in an exposure trial, and they were fine. They were not being attacked by termites or insects or decay, but they looked like crap. Now, the client's going to pay for this, and um, so it's got to look good as well, and I'm guessing this is where Gareth can give you a lot more information. Um, the, it doesn't tell you, the APVMA doesn't tell you how long the product's got to last. Last I heard, the Building Code of Australia said that it has to last six years before, uh, one after installation. Um, so this relates back to the natural durability of the timber, and that's the kind of link between treatments and natural durability. The six years, you, you may start to get serious deterioration if the product is not properly treated. The specifications in Australia, Australian standards. Code mark, Australian tell, standards tell you what you've got to get in the wood. Code mark tells you how to do it. They are, have no legal authority unless they are specified in contracts or, um, or, or, or some sort of building specification. They are called up in building regulations. And um, yeah, there is no police out there, unfortunately, to make sure you're getting get what you think you're getting. About 120 treatment plants in Australia, same number outside. As I said just now, no, no laws about compliance with specification. It's, you're on your own. Um, sorry, I'm, you're on your own. It's um, called industry self-regulation. Um, so it's like putting the fox in charge of the hens. It's the same thing. It says the same thing. Buyer beware. It's up to you guys to make sure you, you're getting the right thing. Large corporates have their own in-house quality. But remember I said there's 120 plants. There's probably about five large corporates with about uh, 15, 16 treatment plants. They have good quality in-house in systems. A, a disturbing number of people don't. There are private QA schemes out there. Some people um, are involved with them. Um, treatment plants. All right. Um, there's vacuum pressure. All right, for water-based water-based processes, you cannot. Sorry, when I'm talking wood preservation, I'm talking long-term protection, at, le at least 15 to 20 years protection. You cannot get that level of protection by a surface coating. So if you've been supplied with the wrong stuff, you can't brush on super goo and make it comply with the national standard. You've got to have it impregnated into the wood. Um, the, there are organic solvent plants. They are a vacuum only treatment plant. Sprays and dips. These are, despite what I just said before, there is a reasonably new formulation on the market 
which is okay for stuff up to about 19 millimeters thick. You can spray it on and the special herbs and spices in the brew will help it penetrate. But as I say, it limits it to a thickness of about 90 mil. Glue line addition, that's for glue laminated products like plywood, um, LVL. I don't know if you guys get it. Uh, you guys use that sort of stuff. Uh, paint on, as I just said, is, is, is predominantly cosmetic. It's not for long-term protection. The only way you're gonna get long-term protection is through maintenance and repeated payment, uh, repeated coating. Now, I said you guys are responsible for the quality of, of, of the, sorry, not you guys, there, there is no checking of quality. The only comeback you've got is through this, this branding system. I'll show you an example in a minute. For your information, all right, that is a preservation plan number. Everybody who sells preserved wood in Australia has their own unique company number. You can get that off the TPAA website, the Timber Preservers Association website. That'll tell you who did the treatment. So if, um, if things turn to custard and you've got to go for someone, this is what you need to show that the job was, was or was not done properly. H2 tells you the preservative. It probably costs you about $120 to $150 to do a chemical analysis to check for preservative retention. That's why we need this information so that you're not checking for all the different approved preservatives. H3, this is what you're interested in, this value here. H3, H4, H5, that's what you're interested in. That tells you, this is a claim. Listen to the words very carefully. If the product is claimed to comply with the national standard, it must carry this information. It must have that information on it. And, oh yeah, this, this, is, um, this is what I was talking about before. Sorry, I should have done this. All right, that's a claim, that's a claim. That's what it looks like, all right? That is, I'm not promoting this particular crowd. I'm just using it as an example of a branded product. According to the national standard, everything over 16 millimetres thick has to be branded. All right, treatment plan information, chemical number, hazard class. If that's not on there, you've got no comeback and it's on you guys. Read that, all right? If the product fails, you've got no recourse if it's not branded. That's the only, way, only link you have. I would highly recommend that you keep copies of brands and um, uh, records of brands and what we use in a job. You all carry mobile phones. That's probably the best way of um, getting records of the stuff that went in. There is a frightful lack of knowledge about treated timber in Australia. It's programs like this that try and get the information out there. Um, there is a lot of information available. A lot of smart people are working in the area, but wood's been around for a long time and everyone thinks they know how to use it properly. The amount of hours and a university course um, spent on timber is a lot less than the amount of hours spent on steel, concrete, plastic, and aluminium. And as you can see there, there is some seriously poor, <laughs> poor use of timber. Come on, come on, little machine. Timber is, a, as, as, as everyone who, will, who, who stops long enough, I will tell, it's a remarkable product. It grows on trees. It will grow back. It is the only building product that does not leave a hole in the ground. Every other building product leaves a hole. Um, and it, it is a great product. And treated properly or, or used properly, it will give you long, good service life. There is a scary fear of chemicals out there. Now, I'm a chemist by training, so I, I, I believe. Anyone who tells you that chemicals are dangerous is either ignorant or of the facts or trying to mislead you. In my opinion, there is no such thing as a dangerous chemical. It's all about dosage. It's all about dose. If you're frightened of chemicals, then don't walk on bitumen with your bare feet because there are so many cancer-forming um, compounds in bitumen that it's not a joke. If you're frightened of chemicals, then don't buy Panadol because in a sachet of Panadol, if you take the whole sachet, you will die from kidney failure. So 
there's a lot of misinformation about there. Everything's got to be natural. And I, as I'm told, that's got to be a natural product. And when I tell them snake venom is also natural. One of the problems with industry is it's spread over a large geographic area. And that makes control difficult. I'm trying to go, oh, paperwork. You guys are drowning in paperwork now. The amount of build, building uh, paperwork that you've got to have is just horrendous. You can get a lot of information out there. Write this down. Q Timber gives you an awful lot of information. It talks about natural durability and the uses of timber and where you can use timber and, and, and everything you need to know. It's free. Look it up on the website. It is free. There's, there's, you can get extra information from there. You can also get, come on, come on, there. Uh, you can also get wood solutions information. Heaps and heaps of information out there. Maybe, yeah, maybe there's too much. Maybe we're drowning in too much information. I don't know. As far as wood preservation is concerned, there's also the Timber Preservers webpage. All right. I hear under the publications tab, you can get some uh, technical notes. They're only one or two pages long on, on, what, on what you need to know about wood protection. Okay, Opt very quickly now, because I'm pushing time. Education, users, geographic locations, very important. You can build stuff differently in Mount Isa than you can in Innisfail. Product treatments, glue laminated timber. Alternatives, natural wood preservatives. If they are any good, they'd be being used now. All right, they're, they're not, they just don't work. Natural wood preservatives don't work. You've got to ramp up the concentration of chemical too high to make it work, to be effective. Heat treatment, you can buy heat treated wood out there. It's no good against termites. Termites love the stuff. So if you buy heat treated wood, it's got to be protected against termites as well. Wood plastic composites, good gear. You've got to change your building practices with that. Um, more use of joists and bearers. Uh, quite heavy. Some of it's good stuff. Some of it's not. Critical fluid. No, there's one in. There's one critical fluid plant in Europe. It's where it's the chemicals are dissolved in carbon dioxide. And um, the um, yeah, I don't. I can't see it happening in Australia. The equipment's way too expensive. Modified wood. You'll see a lot. Some of this coming into Australia now. You might have heard of a product called Acquia. It's the only modified wood um, that I know of um, that for, um, manufactures in commercial quantities. There may be others. It is good stuff, but again, cost. All right, I'm done, guys. Remember, if you've got any questions, you just ask, because if you have any questions about preserved wood, um, yeah, just ask away, because the information's out there. Alistair? Thanks, Jack. Stop. That's great. If you would mind unsharing your screen and we'll fire up Gareth. If people have got questions for Jack, please put them in the Q&A tab and we'll get to those at the end. Thank you, everybody, for your time today. And um, yeah, just give me a sec to get this um, screen sorted out. Um, as always, um, there's usually an issue with um, um, setting up of um, video slides and so forth, but I think that should just be about ready to go. How does that look, uh, Alistair? Not there yet, but we I think we'll be there shortly. And we know this took a little bit of time just to fire up when we get a prep. Apologies for this, people. Great last shot too, uh, Jack. I love the, uh, the Superman uh, connotation there, mate. If you look very closely on the chest, you'll see KP, which is Captain <laughs> Preservation. <laughs> Brilliant. Sorry, Alistair, I think, I don't think it's coming up. It was slow previously. Yeah. Has the screen come up at all? Okay, now it's come. You just need to change over the display settings up the top there in the middle. Uh, Toss. Just up at the top, um, near the top of the screen, where you got display settings. Just click on that one. That'll allow you to shift the screen. So we're just seeing your um, my mouse. 
You can just go across to the left hand side to the display settings up at the top there in the toolbar. Um, yep, let the next one across from that to the right. No, that's uh, not that one. Now the next one, display settings. No, there's no display settings on this one, I'm no. afraid. Yeah. Um, bear with me. Can everybody see that slide anyway, or? But we can, but we can see it in your sort of mode, but we're seeing your slide and the next one coming up rather than the presentation mode. No problems. You know what they say, don't work with kids who are electronic stuff yeah. and animals. And uh, <laughs> uh, no. Have you got two screens? You're just sharing the wrong screen. If, Mate, try uh, hitting F5. F5. Try, try hitting F5. Yeah, I've tried that before. Nothing's working. Right. Apologies for that, people. Um, we might try and kick on anyway. I think um, if everybody can bear with me on, on the screen sharing, my apologies for that. Hang on, just uh, give me a sec. No, it's not uh, not giving me any joy today. So we'll, we'll press on regardless. Um, you can see those sli slides transferring. So I'll yep. run through that. Yep. So basically, just to give everybody a bit of an overview, and again, I do apologize for the, uh, the screen sharing here. Um, Cabot's Premium Wood Care Brands is a business unit of Dulux Group. Uh, we have a, a wide range of well-recognized brands and products across the countryside. Um, part of what uh, part of the business that I'm involved with with Cabot's Premium Wood Care Brands is the commercial brand utilizing the Intergrain brand. So a lot of this presentation is covered by uh, Intergrain, but uh, we do have a quite a wide host of finishing systems and also um, also wood care products. So from a coating perspective, why on earth would we want to coat timber? Well, I think um, Jack kindly touched on that as, on, it, on it quite uh, poignantly in the last presentation and quite a lot of assumptions are made about uh, finishing timber, um, which quite clearly aren't correct. And I think uh, utilizing correct preparation of timber and also uh, the finishing of timber is, is very critical for long-term durability. Uh, we want to be able to enhance and protect timber uh, and, and highlight the natural beauty of it. Uh, we want to provide resistance to UV, UV degradation and oxidization. Uh, we want to try and minimize some structural deterioration by the use of uh, penetrating timber oils, uh, provide durability and protection to, to basically to the substrate, and also uh, give some resistance to mold, algae, and fungal growth. Uh, we also want to provide some resistance against mechanical damage such as foot traffic, decking and so forth. But also we wanna be able to provide a range of products, services and systems that will ease long-term maintenance as well. We'll touch base on the four main timber coating systems uh, throughout this presentation. Um, we'll talk about film forming products, which typically are your film forming clears. Also uh, your penetrating oils uh, and also your uh, partial film forming technologies, which are water-based modified oils as well as our traditional paint systems, which would, would normally consist as a multi-layer system, usually consisting of a primer or in some instances, just a, um, a, uh, a, a, a primed or, or self-priming type system. Moving forward, uh, talking about film forming, penetrating and, and partial film systems, what does this actually all mean? Basically, uh, we're looking at a range of paint systems that are either water or solvent based, these systems will typically protect from the outside, so to protect from the outside in. Uh, they'll contain additives for flexibility, fade resistant pigments, and also UV absorbers to provide long-term durability. Um, and again, give a range of sheen levels in these film forming products. Modified water-based oil systems. These systems are partial film forming. It sounds a bit odd when we talk about putting oil and water together and they actually work. We have some, uh, rather unique technologies available out there in the wider market, which will now uh, water solubilize a range of um, oil-based products. These particular products usually have a small component of uh, resin in them, usually in a high performance acrylic resin to give you both long-term durability, the ability to put um, uh, non-slip additives into it, but also uh, provide the benefit of um, UV absorbers, flexibility, fade resistance and so forth. These products are typically more ideal for decking applications. And the last set being protective penetrating oils. These protect the timber from the inside out. They protect mostly against 
uh, water penetration. They don't provide your H3 type performance requirements as quite often is thought in the industry. And as Jack sort of covered off before, the, the importance of those treatments are quite specific to a range of Australian standards. Penetrating oils typically give more natural look to the timber. These systems won't flake or peel. And uh, clear oils, without the addition of any colour additive, will naturally allow the timber to silver naturally over time. Um, but with the addition of, of a colour additive, will actually provide some, um, uh, some protection against uh, UV uh, fading. But ultimately, most oil systems will typically fade a lot more than, than other systems. All right, so which systems typically would you use where? I've grouped these together basically into the film forming and par partial film forming systems. Pretty much well, all exterior areas uh, for timber coating systems. With water-based film forming systems, obviously they have low VOC type uh, systems offer uh, uh, certainly some benefits from an internal perspective. But also, uh, as you can imagine, um, having film forming products uh, will give you a wide range of uh, different performance characteristics for all external elements. Um, typically, the exterior uh, partial film forming products generally group into the exterior stains type of group of products. So again, designed to enhance uh, protection of natural timber, uh, utilized pretty much well on decking steps, exterior and interior. And you can also add an anti-slip or with uh, some systems, you'll actually have a slip resistant built in. Um, pretty much well, all applications where you want to finish timber with the exterior stains, they're all designed to change color of the timber naturally or preserve the, lo the longer term aesthetic color of timber. When we st start talking about clear oils and, um, and color additives, uh, clear oils, as I mentioned before, are designed to allow the timber to silver naturally over time. Uh, color additives will just prolong the aesthetic of the timber uh, to give you uh, retention of color. Um, but again, ideally used for decking steps, anything for external or internal environments. Typically, your external pen or your penetrating oils rather will be an oil based product. Uh, they'll be solvent based, so they have a little bit better penetration into the timber and typically used for that type of application where a more natural look of timber is being used without that traditional sort of plasticky look of a, uh, a clear finish. As a coating manufacturer, it's quite an interesting question that I usually get presented with usually is I, I'll get a project uh, manager bring me up and say look there's a problem with your coating can you come out and have a look and I would have to say probably 98 to 99 percent of the time it's usually operator error that is causing the problems and for me to underscore the benefits of the right products um, this is an example of some external cladding um, that uh, we came across not that long ago, um, seeing some significant deterioration. This happened within a 12 month period, mind you. Uh, poor exterior durability, there was insufficient preparation, uh, not following the technical recommendation on the technical data sheets or on the labels of the products. Um, wasn't necessarily an issue with chemical attack, but these are some of the other issues that can be seen with uh, degradation of films over a period of time. Uh, water damage can be an issue drying out of the timber can be a problem. Uh, too many coats too soon can be a problem. Not enough coats. There are all these different influencing factors that can also uh, determine how well or how poorly a film will perform over time. And uh, as I sort of outlined here, it, the, the key with any coating system is about pro providing and following the technical data outlined from all, for all products. So as a coatings manufacturer, we need to make sure that the technical recommendations and labels and, and TDSs are followed. You know, it'll give, it'll give you a product overview of what it does and how well it'll perform. It'll always give you some recommendations on preparation, how much to apply and how many coats to apply. Quite often I'm talking with builders and project managers who want to reduce the amount of coats. I can tell you that um, from our perspective as a coating manufacturer, we, we recommend a minimum coating uh, available. So that would usually be between two and three coats. Then that will also re reference the square, the square metre spread rate per coat. Um, the ideal application conditions and weather conditions, usually we say somewhere around about 25 degrees Celsius at around about 50% relative humidity are the ideal conditions. will give you a dry time of XYZ. Um, if it's going to be cooler, if it's going to be hotter, that will affect your dry times and also your spread rates. So something to be mindful of 
and underscores how important it is to uh, to read this technical information as well, particularly when you're talking to your contractors when they're applying these materials. Don't just assume that a lot of these guys being the uh, contractors will know how to apply products correctly. And it's always um, good practice to make sure that when specifying products um, for uh, the finishing of external timber is to, to, to note to follow the, ma the manufacturer's recommended detail uh, with regard to how many coats and square, uh, spread rates as well. All of this data will help um, the, the, the contractors with their quoting, uh, their product selection, obviously general performance. If there's still any doubt about the performance of any product or how to apply it, you, know, you can always get in contact with us. We're always happy to help and guide people through that whole process. From a performance uh, perspective, as consumers, we expect an awful lot for timber finishes, bearing in mind that when we look at um, timber coatings per se, we're talking about timber coatings in this instance where we're trying to highlight and protect the grain of timber. Forget the, uh, the, the benefits of a uh, fully film forming paint system, which basically protects the substrate. We're wanting to, to highlight the substrate to, to show the natural beauty. So making sure that we have products that can give best protection uh, against UV damage and to the substrate, uh, provide flexibility with expansion and contraction in external environments, provide uh, surface protection with it being film forming or penetrating, or a combination of both with water and hybrid oils. And obviously we wanna try and enhance the grain. So we, as manufacturers, test a lot of our products, uh, both independently and, and uh, internally for performance. Most of our systems are tested up in uh, far North Queensland. And we certainly have a wide range of uh, ongoing checks and balances in place that uh, we will check the performance that we make or the claims that we make of our products are actually going to provide the level of performance that everybody is demanding as well. So from a timber coatings performance, I put together a really basic simple analogy of what that actually means. So with dual coat uh, penetrating oils, they typically protect from the inside of the timber. You can pretty much all guarantee that's gonna be like the, the traditional um, um, coconut oil or tanning oil. Um, really good for uh, improving your moisturization, but uh, really lousy for protecting you against um, sunburn. Uh, same works with timber. This will cause the timber to gray naturally rather than, um, rather than protect it. When we start talking about multiple coat, clear coat systems, uh, these systems are film forming and protect from the outside in. We typically regard these systems as being about an SPF 15 as a broad sense. This is not exact, but it's just a broad sense indication of what this actually means. And these uh, film forming clears uh, ultimately um, will provide you with a reasonably good level of exterior durability and protection. Then we start talking about the multiple, uh, multiple coat um, partial film forming systems. These are the modified water-based oils uh, these products uh, provide a little bit of uh, penetration within the timber, but also some external protection. You could pretty much well regard these as SP25 plus type products, bearing in mind that both uh, film forming clears and partial film forming products do contain pigments in them. Uh, in some instances with the clears, might I add, uh, the clears do have, actually have a small component of uh, pigment within them. Usually you'll see a, uh, a yellower tint to the, uh, the clear coat, this is purely there to provide long-term um, color retention to the timber. If we didn't have that, the timber would actually gray underneath and developing a technology uh, that will give you that protection without the yellow tint is very difficult. Believe me, we're working on it and we're still definitely developing products to cover that. In the final uh, multiple coats, opaque type systems. So these are traditional paint systems, these year regarded as your SPF 50s or your zinc creams of, of the paint world. These products will probably provide the longest term durability. And in general terms, um, because we're not trying to highlight the base of the timber, uh, the natural grain, usually these systems will probably require a little less maintenance than the other three systems. So when we talk about long-term durability, we talk about care, inspection and maintenance of timber finishes. Um, we, we do outline a range of criteria for that, be it for external landscaping uh, applications, be it for actual building and structural timber. Um, generally, it's determined by the location and the orientation to exposure. 
And obviously mechanical damage being foot traffic, every coating system will, will degrade over time. And um, every system when exposed to some form of mechanical damage will start to deteriorate. Also uh, making sure that uh, a regular cleaning, in, uh, cleaning process is in place, removing any surface surface contaminations that can comp compromise the performance of the coatings. A good example is sea salts on film forming, uh, film forming uh, coatings will also need a level of um, clean down and uh, rinsing, usually on all of these systems, a mild detergent or a specific timber cleaner for uh, these types of applications in a rinse. Inspections always a must. So during that, that, um, that, uh, that initial cleaning process is obviously observe any signs of port of water repellents discoloration of the timber or any damage and address it as soon as it's identified. So we too work closely with uh, property services managers and so forth in the instance that, um, you know, they, they're putting in a care and maintenance um, regime, a little bit harder on, um, on external uh, landscaping elements. But again, it's certainly worth considering about putting in some form of maintenance recommendation. Always happy to talk with you, you and your clients with regard to putting together something more specific for each individual project. And obviously maintenance coating. We talk a lot about maintenance coating in a lot of what we uh, present with regard to care and maintenance. And think about this as your, um, your traditional sunscreen. So if you're going out there with an SPF 15 or SPF 25, what do you do every couple of hours? You reapply, it's no different. For coating systems that are designed to enhance and beautify timber, that has to be done as well. Usually it's a clean, it's usually a reapply every 12 months to two years, possibly maybe even longer, depending on the location. And then we go from there. Next slide is just a bit of an idea of the, uh, the timber finish maintenance cycle. Um, we go through the, the, the application process, the resins and solvents are soaking into the, the, um, the, uh, the timber um, that goes through the drying process, those solvents, and I, I dare, also make recommendation that those solvents can also be water as they drive off through the drying process. They then um, basically come together to agglomerate into a, a nice, even, consistent finish. It starts protecting the timber. Now, during that process, we start to want to in incorporate that, um, that, uh, that care and maintenance regime because uh, ultimately those coatings will start to break down. Capturing it at those early stages is always critical and thus uh, going back into that application and drying and maintenance phase from that point forward. On a bit of a footnote, uh, I also see a lot of detail with regard to uh, the specification of rough sawn timbers, uh, penetrating oils and the recommendation to put an anti-slip agent into a penetrating oil to give you slip resistance. The reality is that that just doesn't work. It's really important to make sure that if you're, certainly if you're specifying for slip resistant finishes on, um, on, uh, on, on timber decking and, and steps and componentry uh, as such, that uh, there are certain range of products that will give you that level of performance. Some of the, uh, the, the slip resistance data that is available as a manufacturer, we literally have it there on hand and can put it uh, to a particular client uh, as needed. So basically the amount of coats will uh, basically give us the, uh, the ratings required, whether it be P4 or P5 commercial environments. This information is always provided by an ARTA uh, tested laboratory. So we get this externally tested. There are slip resistant requirements where that uh, that uh, little slip resistant apparatus is tested on site and must meet those requirements. Hugely subjective if somebody's not uh, uh, performing those tests correctly. We prefer to go down the path of have them independently assessed and provide you with a range of products, systems and specifications that will guarantee that level of performance uh, pretty much well um, straight up. So again, more than happy to help anybody out with regard to slip resistance performance. So from that, uh, why we coat, just to, to recap is obviously why we want to coat timber, hopefully uh, understand a bit of difference between the coating systems that are available, uh, why problems can happen with timber coatings, uh, be it uh, insufficient coating, uh, climatic conditions can be a major issue that can influence that coating. Uh, the importance of reading the technical information because all the information of the product is there. Uh, and certainly for the contractors, it's very important then for them to follow that information. We make 
uh, that information freely available. We don't just have that information there for, for the heck of it. And that data is pretty much on the side of every container of material that we provide. Um, also the performance of timber coatings, getting a bit of a rough idea. I know I've probably not given everybody absolute concrete um, performance data, but at the end of the day, the performance of coatings is, is always dictated by the level of UV exposure and also how frequently or how often it's being um, cleaned, maintained, inspected, and potentially repainted if needed. And also um, understand the differences of slip resistance and the like. So if uh, I am pretty much well done and dusted, so I thank you for your patience and also for putting up with the, uh, the presentation in this current format for whatever reason it didn't want to work. Thanks, Gareth. Who wouldn't mind just unsharing your screen, Lynn? And thanks yep. also, Jack. Just, um, so uh, well, we're just on one, so we, we don't have time for a lot of questions here, but um, Jack, there has been one you've probably seen that's come up uh, through a number of people just asking about uh, uh, education and playground settings and, uh, and the use of CCA software. Do you might just want to comment on that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, okay. Look, um, you can't use CCA for playground settings. That's a edict by the APVMA, the Australian Pest and Veterinary Medicines Authority. You are not allowed to use it. Um, alternatives are ACQ or copper azol. Um, the, I, I can't remember what technical note it is, um, but um, on the TPAA website, you will see under the publications tab, technical notes on preservative numbers. Um, that's the second set of numbers in the brand. You can pick ACQ or copper azol treated timber from those, from those numbers. All right, but the, the you, you know, as I say, you're not allowed to use um, CCA for playground equipment because the child might eat half a cubic foot of wood. Um, and if the child can eat half a cubic foot of wood, I say you've got other issues. Yeah, that, that's right. So, so I mean, you, you may often see playgrounds that look like they're treated in uh, CCA, but they're not. They've got that sort of look, that um, that, that, that greeny look, but that's due to yeah. the top of base. So that could be an ACQ type treatment, which is probably more likely. Yeah. Right, well, look, um, thanks very much for your presentation, Jets. Um, we uh, we haven't really got time for a lot of questions now, um, but to really appreciate all that was covered. Um, just a reminder to everyone that um, the webinars are all recorded and will be available for the Wood Solutions website. This one will be uploaded again in the next couple of days' time, and the previous ones are already up there uh, on, the, on the website. Um, just also a reminder of two of the technical design guides that um, will be quite useful to you. So a lot of the stuff which was mentioned today is included in, in both of these. So just go to the woodsolutions.com website and you can download those for free. I'd certainly encourage you to do that for your library. And uh, just a reminder that we have one more um, webinar in our series next week, um, Wood in Bushfire Prone Areas. And this is a really important topic now for landscape architects. Uh, with the number of the wildfires we've had recently, a lot of our bushfire attack level areas have increased uh, right throughout Australia. So it's really important to know um, how you design and specify in bushfire prone areas, both from uh, different products and from the vegetation you use. So we'd encourage you to participate in that last webinar on the 26th. And if you hadn't registered already, you certainly can do so. So thanks once again, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again next weekend and have a great day. See ya. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alistair. Thanks, Alistair. Appreciate it.